Welcome to this conference. I'm so excited to be here. Android Makers, actually, when it was called like uh, DroidCon Paris, is the very first conference I spoke at. Like, I remember driving here on a whim. I didn't even get accepted as a talk. Like, I just drove here for the bar camp. They sent me over like an email, like, hey, we can schedule you, but here's a free ticket if you come over, like maybe on the bar camp. So I remember like driving over here, um, like applying for the bar camp, which was super weird, and I was able to speak. And I remember like totally not knowing what I was doing, like being super nervous. And here we are, like seven years later, and I'm back here. Um, super excited to be here. Still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm still hope like uh, that I can give you something like interesting to listen to. Uh, but at least like thanks all for coming. I'm gonna talk about like a topic that's quite dear to my heart. Android library development, which is, to be honest, a bit underrated, I would say, because being able to like build reusable components um, that actually enables us to not always have to reinvent the wheel all over again, and this is what like fundamentally drives the innovation in the ecosystem, yet resources and tooling on this topic are like rather sparse, so that's why I feel good talking about it. So before we get started, a little word about myself. So I'm Jeroen Mols, I'm Belgium, I'm a remote Android developer for Plaat, and I'm also a Google developer expert in Android. If you want to follow like what I'm doing, I'm at Molsjoen on Twitter. Um, and the company I work for is like a fintech company. We build an API layer to enable like to power other fintech apps to be built on top of us. So we're a financial data aggregator. And we actually have like open Android vacancies. Um, it's a remote position, the vacancy says US only, but like here I am, I live in Europe and I work for the team anyway, so like I'm pretty sure we can be a bit lenient on that. If you want to learn more, just come to me and I can explain you a bit more. So, cool. This is what we want to cover today. So, I'm not gonna like read the list, you can all read. Um, but I do want to give like a minor disclaimer before I get started. So when I use like SDK, Software Development Kit, or Android Library, like in this talk, to me, they mean the exact same thing. So don't get confused if I use them like interchangeably. Cool. So what do we actually want to do? So if you think about like apps, apps use libraries, and those libraries, they, yeah, they're not like included as source code in the app, but they come from Maven. And what we want to do is we want to build our own library that's published to Maven um, and that can be included in like a customer application uh, using a one-liner um, like this. Clear? So let's, let's get down to it. Um, so how do we do this? Of course, we're going to use our preferred tool, Android Studio to the rescue. We just open it up, create a new project, and oh, snap. There isn't a template to create an Android library in Android Studio. And this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this talk. Like, unfortunately, the tooling for Android libraries is lagging behind. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to create an app, like you've done quite a few times already before. Um, we just like open Android Studio, new project wiz wizard, pick any of the templates, doesn't really matter. And then to that app module, we're gonna add a second module which is called library. So we also go to the wizard, here we select Android library as a module type, and here we are, this is like the project layout we end up with. So we have an app module and we have a library module. If we now go to the library module, you can see there's a different Gradle plugin applied, so it's not com.android.application, it's com.android.library. And if you go to the app module, you can see that it actually depends on our library module. And if we want to run this, like a library isn't runnable by itself, so we can't just like start up the library, we need to like include it in something. So to run our SDK, we're gonna run the test app, which you can do using this command or just like um, the tool window um, and to run all of the unit tests, just right click on the folder and run them or run these Gradle commands. If we want to like release our SDK though, we need to invoke like this Gradle task to actually build the SDK, which will yield an AAR file, which is then placed in like build outputs AAR. Um, and that's, there it is. 
this AR file is what we'll actually be distributing to others. So it's like a binary, a compiled version of our SDK, which contains both like resources and code. So quick detour about file formats. So the file format you're probably already familiar with is like an APK. This is an actual app. Like nowadays, we usually ship like app bundles. I think it's even mandatory now. But like behind the scenes, it still works with APK, so Google will still install APKs for you. And like we can reason about APKs in like the same way as we do with bundles. So an APK can contain like compiled codes, processed resources, a manifest, and also transitive dependencies. It's actually runnable and it needs to be signed. Contrast that to like a jar, a Java archive that just contains code and that's it. It's unsigned um, and like it's not runnable by itself on an Android device at least. Now, the jar format is still pretty useful because for instance like OKHTP, OK they just ship a jar file. So it's like it's not like it's not usable, it's just like for the use case where you don't need any resources, like this is a really good solution. And second thing to note is it's not because it's a jar file that you can't access any Android APIs. So these can still like talk to Android APIs. Then the AAR, so this is the format we're building in our example. This is the same as a jar file, but it can also contain like uh, compiled resources and actually, so processed resources and an Android manifest. So if you now compare both of these, there's like a few interesting consequences already. So one, if we ship a library, we don't need to sign it. Libraries are unsigned. And two, like AAR files, they don't contain the transitive dependencies. Like an APK file contains everything, an AAR file doesn't. That's going to be more relevant later on. So if we want to distribute this, like distributing a library is actually pretty tedious. Like the Maven repository you likely want to use is Maven Central, but it's really not that straightforward to use. Um, like it's not hard, it's just like tedious. Um, there's a great tutorial by Martin Brown about this, uh, but essentially you build your release like I showed you before, you then generate a PGP key and you also publish it somewhere, then you sign that build so people can actually see that you're the one that created that build, and then you upload it to Maven Central. Um, this is like again one of those things where I feel like the tooling for like Android libraries is lacking. Um, like what if there was just like a very easy way to like drag and drop like an AAR file in like the Google Play console and then magically it gets published with every bells and whistles. Would be easier in my opinion. Okay, cool. Transitive dependencies. So this is like probably the most confusing and important part about building libraries. So hence I want to try and give you like a good understanding of this. So if we scale our library, we may also start depending on like other libraries of ourselves. For instance, like on OKHTP, which comes from Maven. But when a customer now integrates our library, remember that AAR files don't contain the compiled transitive dependencies. So when a user now integrates our SDK into their project, compilation would break. So they would actually need to explicitly add OKHTP OK as a dependency in order for this to work. This is because the AAR file doesn't contain any transitive dependencies. Um, so now our customers need to have two lines to integrate our SDK, which isn't great. Wouldn't it be cool if we can like modify this to a single line? Um, so that if users add that line to their app, they're going to get OK HTTP through our library. So they add a dependency on our library, and they get OK HTTP for free. This is what they call a transitive dependency, because the customer app, they don't define, they don't declare a dependency on OK HTTP. They just say, we need library, and then they also get OK HTTP for free. And the way that works is with the pom.xml file. So when we publish to Maven, we don't just publish the AAR file, we also publish like an XML file which contains a bunch of metadata, like our library name, group ID, version, and also a list of dependencies. Uh, so also a list of dependencies. 
Um, so you can actually go to Maven Central, for instance, for the plot SDK, and you can see what files we publish. And you see, like, there's a bunch of different files, a bunch of, like, checksums. If you go to OKHTTP, OK for instance, they also release um, sources.char, javadoc.char. Um, and this also brings up an important point, because if you want to test whether your library works or not, you need to test it through Maven. Because remember, none of this was a problem in our test project, right? Because the app module included the library module, and then Maven just like shoves all of the transitive dependencies into like the actual APK. But once we distribute our library to Maven, we need to add the metadata so Maven also know, like Gradle also knows where to go and fetch all the dependencies. Cool. So let's talk about modularization. Um, so modularization is quite common for apps nowadays. Who here has a modularized app? Yeah, cool. So it's quite common. There's like a plethora of advantages. I clearly don't have to like explain those to you. Um, but so it makes us wonder, like, should we also modularize our SDK, right? So let's try exactly that. We're going to add two modules to our library, a database and a UI components module. And the way we do that is like exactly the same as how we created the library module. We create a new module. Pro tip, if you prefix your module name with like colon and then something else, like your colon modules colon, that will actually create a module in like a subfolder. Um, so we create two new modules. We extend our library so that it depends on those two modules. And this is then the project which we end up with. So we have an app that uses our library, and we have a library that uses two modules. Let's now add some code. So our app module is going to initialize the library. The library is then going to initialize the database, and the database is just going to do some stuff, like print uh, a message. Um, this brings us to the first problem. Like submodules, they're not part of the AAR. Um, so if you build your library using assemble release and then consume that library directly into an app, like you just consume the rough AAR file, um, then you're going to run into like a class not found exception. Weird, right? So if we go and look at the actual AAR file, you can see that in the AAR file you have code for the library, but there is no code for the database there. And if you wonder, like, shouldn't, like, Android Studio or, like, the Android plugin handle this for us? Well, then, I'm wondering the same thing. Like, this is, again, a case where, like, Android tools is lacking. And there is actually, like, an open issue about this, um, which clearly describes this, but it's already been open for, like, five or six years at this point and still hasn't been resolved, unfortunately. Um, it got reassigned this morning. And also last week, they, they mentioned that they were going to do something about it. But like, to be honest, I wouldn't keep my hopes up. Um, so yeah, that begs the question, like, if this doesn't work, like, what can we do about it? So the first thing we can do is, instead of only publishing library to Maven, we could also ship UI components and database directly to Maven. And then instead of like in our library project, instead of like adding them as like an implementation project, we're going to add them as like a Maven dependency there. Now, this clearly affects our workflow, right? Because if we now want to make a change to the database, we would have to like create a new version of the database, publish it to Maven Central, wait for it to be published, then we can update our app and start our library and start using it in the library. So it does significantly impact our workflow. And also, keep in mind that like publishing this database might not make sense. Like this database is not a general purpose database like Room is that others can use, right? This is just like our very specific internal database that's not really going to be reusable by others. Um, but so this all being said, that doesn't mean that this mechanism doesn't work at all. Because like Android X is like the prime example of this. They do this like at quite a large scale. So this definitely can be successful. The second thing we can do is FAT AAR. So FAT AAR is where 
we, instead of creating a light AR that doesn't contain like the submodules, we just create a fatter one that contains all the submodules. Um, to do that, you need to use a plugin, for instance, like the Fat AR plugin written by Keyzong, um, and then you need to change your dependencies from implementation to embed. And that will tell the plugin, like, hey, also copy all of the resources and code into there. Um, while this works pretty well, it has some downsides. Like, one, this plugin isn't written and maintained by Google, so that means it has to rely on some like internals of like the Android Gradle plugin. And if Google renames Gradle tasks, which they used to do a lot, but they're not really doing it lately anymore, then this plugin would break. And like if Google then releases the new plugin, you can't immediately update to the new plugin. You need to wait for this library to fix things, which is like tedious. Um, but this library author honestly is like really good at like fixing it within two or three weeks. Um, and then there's another disadvantage that like you may end up with like a slightly more bloated AAR file um, just because of the way this like references resources, but that's solvable. Um, and then obviously like we could also just like not modularize our SDK altogether. And this is actually like what we're now doing at Plant. Like we used to be very naive and aggressive on modules. We're no longer so naive and we're like trimming down the amount of modules we use. And the second problem is that if we look at visibility modifiers, so Kotlin has private, which means only this class can see. It has protected, which means this class and the subclasses can see. It has internal, which is my favorite modifier, which means like anyone within the module can see, but nobody outside. Or it has public, which is like everyone, the entire world can see. What is notably absent from here is like a project internal. So anyone within our SDK can see or within our project, but nobody outside of it can see. So that means that in our example of before, where we actually, so we had an initialized method on our database, because we exposed that from the database module to the library module, we're exposing it to the entire world. So also the app can access this, um, and any of our customers would also be able to access this. Which, like, it's not great because, like, one, it creates confusion for our customers, because suddenly they're gonna see, like, a lot more classes in their SDK than they probably, than they would need to use, and it's just gonna confuse them. And secondly, like, they might do things to our database, like initialize it themselves, which then creates like weird issues in our SDK. So clearly we don't want this. So what can we do about this? Like, the easiest thing we can do is we can just like rename the package of the database and we put an internal modifier in this. This then discourages use, but it doesn't prevent it. But still, for instance, OKHTP OK has an internal package, so this is still used. Um, a slightly more aggressive way to do it is what if we run ProGuard over the classes that shouldn't be used? So instead of being like com.yourroommalls.database, we rename it to like a.a.a. .a .a. So this still doesn't prevent use, but like customers won't be able to figure out like what this class is about, so it's a lot less likely that they're going to use it. Um, so this actually works quite well, except that you don't want to do exactly this, because like every time you run ProGuard on a project, it will always create a class with like this prefix. So that would create collisions if like two libraries do the same thing. So instead, you can like add this ProGuard modifier where you say like, hey, obfuscate everything, but also like repackage the classes into my namespace so that they're globally unique, and then we can't have collisions with like other uh, libraries. Um, and last but not least, if you just go single module SDK, you also don't have these issues. So, what would my recommendation be for like Android libraries? Like, if you have a m small to mid-sized SDK, I just wouldn't bother with like modularization altogether. And once your SDK grows, like more functionality is going to be added to it, and then either you maybe want to split your SDK to like expose like different features to customers so they can pick like I'm only using feature A or only B, so that you split in that way, or 
it could also be that you're building out like a very extensive like storage module or whatever, which could be like also interesting for others to use, and then that's something you can give back to the community. So I would start single module and then like scale up. If you really start feeling pain, you may want to like split up some modules as like a separate Maven artifacts. Um, make sure to always reduce your public API surface and know that like tooling is lacking. Cool. Up to the most painful part of the talk. Like I mentioned transitive dependencies are important. Um, they can also be a really pain, really painful as a library developer. So let's see what can happen with transitive dependencies. So we have one of our customers. They're always, they're already using like another library which has some transitive dependencies. And now all of a the sudden they're going to start using our library, and we obviously also have some other transitive dependencies. Now in this setup, a few things could happen. Like one, the library dependency versions could like conflict, or two, they could be like downright incompatible. So let's look at like version conflicts first. Um, so this is the setup, uh, a customer that's using like library and then another library. Um, and imagine that like another library is using OKHTTP v3 and our library is using OKHTTP v4. Now what? Like I've mentioned before that like every single class can only be on your build path a single time or you will have like duplicate class exception. So now here like what does Gradle do, right? They, they would need to use some kind of heuristic to choose like am I going to use like v3 or v4 because it can't include both of them. So every build system has like a different heuristic to choose and Gradle will actually pick the highest version. So it's going to choose like, okay, HTTP v4 here, which is usually fine because libraries are like backwards compatible, except when it doesn't. So this is something we ran into. Um, okay, HTTP, they dropped support for like older Android versions in like version 3.13. So before it would work on Jelly Bean, after it would no longer work on Jelly Bean. So imagine if you have like a customer that's using okay, HTTP, 3.12, and they suddenly include our library, we require 3.13, so Gradle resolves 3.13, which there is no breaking API change between both versions, so they're like binary and source compatible. So like the build will work just fine, but when the customer distributes that application to customers, it's gonna blow up at the runtime because okay, HTTP will expect like um, API 21 level classes to be there, which they aren't. Um, so, what can we do about this? So either we can ask the customer to force a particular dependency resolution, we can loosen the dependency requirements on our app, like did we really need OKCDP 3.13, or we can completely remove the transitive dependency for our library altogether. Um, so to remove it from like a customer application, there is this dependency exclusion. So a customer can say, hey, we want to use your library, but exclude this group. Or a slightly alternative way to do this, you can like do the configurations block, you can add like a global um, resolution rule where you then say always force this version. Um, the great thing about this for us as a library developer is we don't have to do anything. Um, the downside about this is like the onus is completely on our customer. So they will have to eat the burden, they will have to like change their integration. Um, so like obviously this isn't great. And it's also, if you think about what the customer is really doing in this case, they're forcing our SDK to work with a version of OKHTTP that we haven't tested ourselves with. So it's also like a risk on their behalf. And I'd like to talk about like a very special case about this. Like what if you want to make a breaking change to your API? So let's look at like OKHTTP v OKHTTP v3. Um, so in OKHTTP v2, um, there was like, there were different methods like cancel, like all of the methods also had like set or get prefixes and they got dropped in like OKHTTP v3. But if Gradle now 
wants to choose what version to use, like there is no good version they can choose, right? Because the API is different. They're like source and binary incompatible. So the way OKHTTP handles that is they do two things. So one, they change their Maven coordinates. So in OKHTTP, like com.squareup.okhttp3, like the version is in the Maven artifact. So from Gradle's point of view, Okay, HTTP 2 and 3, they're not like a new version of the same library. They're com two completely different artifacts. And then the other thing they do is they also update their package name. So a single app can have both OK HTTP v2 and v3 in there and coexist. So that may be like slightly inefficient because like the thread pool could be duplicated or whatever, but at least this is going to work. Um, and then the second problem is incompatible transitive dependencies. Um, so this is where protobuf comes into play. Who knows protobuf? Ooh, most of you. Awesome. Um, so protobuf is, it's like JSON, but then like slightly more advanced. And like one of the downsides is that it like, it comes with the standard library, which is like fairly large, which is protobuf Java. Um, but there's also like a slimmer variant, Protobuf Java Lite, which like if you go to their website, they say like you should use Java Lite on Android. Um, but so the problem is both of these, they cannot coexist in the same app because they fundamentally contain the same classes, except Protobuf Java contains more classes than Protobuf Java Lite does. So if you like include both of these in the same app, you're gonna get like a compilation exception where you have like a duplicate class exception. And this actually happened to us fairly recently, like even in like April 2020, like Firebase shipped with the wrong version of Protobuf, causing then like a conflict with our SDK. Um, so what can you do about this? Like same thing, we can ask our customer to like substitute things that works exactly the same as before. We can also remove this dependency from our transitive dependencies, which is pretty cool. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Or we can just like stop using the transitive dependency altogether. So we, at some point, were using like a Kotlin generator for protobuf called PBNK. Great library, by the way. Um, but they, because they're multi-platform, they were using protobuf Java. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to use them but not use their incorrect protobuf Java artifact. And fortunately, Maven has a way to do that. So in your pom.xml, you can say like, hey, use protobuf, no, use pbnk, but exclude like protobuf from your library. Um, or how you do it like in your build.gradle file, it's um, you append a node when you're generating the pom.xml. So this is great, because if now a customer like integrates us into their app, they're only getting like the library and PB and K. Um, so in this case, it would work well. It's a shame that like the, the gray isn't coming through. Um, but imagine if now somebody is only using our library and not the other library, they wouldn't have a version of like protobuf on their bot. So we would need to explicitly add like protobuf Java Lite ourselves to make sure that it works in all cases. So what would I recommend with regards to transitive dependencies? Minimize them. Like I used to be like super eager because like in the app world is totally fine. There's so many great dependencies. Just use them and then like speed up your process. Um, but I no longer feel that way for like SDKs. And if you use a transitive dependency, make sure to use like a stable version because like it could be fine for you to use like an alpha version of like Android X, but if you pick that alpha version, you could also force your customer to use that alpha version. And like that choice could be fine for you, but we can't make that choice for our customers, right? Um, check like the versions you use for known vulnerabilities. Don't use the latest dependency version. Like we at Plant, we try to aim for a version that's like between half a year to a year old. And like adoption rate of our SDK lags behind a bit. So our customers are gonna be like between one and a half years to a year lagging on their dependency versions. So that gives them like like 
a normal case would give them like more or less a year to update all of their dependencies without them running into like a conflict with our library, which seems like a good trade-off. Um, and then also, like lastly, only use libraries that handle breaking changes really well. And if you break these rules, totally fine, but that like just put it in your release notes. Like last year, we added support for the activity result contract, which forced us to use like the latest version of like Android X fragment. So we did, but then we put it in our release notes. So like if that causes a, cost a problem for a customer, they can go to our release notes and see, ah, okay, it's because of the activity result contract. Um, and then a tip, final tip with regards to transitive dependencies. There is a Gradle task you can run called dependencies. You can even add like configuration filters to it. And this will print a very verbose list of all of your dependencies and their transitive dependencies, which is like a great tool to try and debug like what is going wrong if you have a conflict. And lastly, like remember, and this is frustrating, like even if you're doing the right thing in your SDK, like if we're using the right protobuf version and Firebase isn't, like the last SDK that gets added to a customer app is gonna get the blame, right? So like Firebase was doing the wrong thing, we got added and then suddenly like we got issues reported. But then it's very difficult to like explain that to customers, like this is not something we can solve, it's just like a general frustration I have. Cool, so let's quickly go over some tips and tools. So library resources. By default, all of the resources of your library are gonna be public. So all of the strings, drawables, dimensions, themes are accessible, are accessible by all of your customers. There is a way to hide them, which is by defining a public.xml. But it's actually like a way to hide them. Because if you create this XML, like Gradle will put a public.txt in the AAR file, and then Android Studio Autocomplete won't suggest those resources to be used. So this hides the resources from Autocomplete, but somebody could still access your resources if they want to. So what you should also do is make sure that all of your resources have a unique prefix. Because like, take for instance, like a very common string that I've defined many times is like error, no network. Like imagine if you define such a string, like that string can actually be overwritten by another library or even by the customer app. And you don't want that to accidentally happen. So the way we can do that is by adding a resource prefix. And unfortunately, there are no tools to like add a resource prefix to all of our resources. So what you can do is you can add this to your build.gradle file, which just is a hint to Android Studio, only works in Android Studio, and then you get like build warnings or errors, like, hey, you, this resource isn't prefixed, and that's a hint for you to go and fix that. Um, now, compatibility. Let's talk about source and binary compatibility. This is cool stuff. So imagine that like a customer is using like the V1 version of our library, and they now update to v2. All right. So in v1 of our library, we had an initialized method that didn't take any parameters. In v2, we added like a new parameter, use caching. Well, if we do this, and if our customer updates our library version, they're going to get a compilation error. Because in their code, they were expecting like the version of initialized to exist without parameters but it no longer exists, so compilation error. There's an easy way to fix that. We just add a default parameter, and now they're like source compatible. So this is source compatibility. But there's also binary compatibility. If we now decompile the source code, so you decompile the Kotlin code, and you see what's actually generated, you can see that like in V1, there is an initialize with like a single, so without parameters, but that doesn't exist in initialized v2. So even though both are like source compatible, they aren't binary compatible. And why does that matter? Um, that matters because if our customer is directly using v2 of our library, and they're using another library that's using v1, what Gradle is going to do is, Gradle is going to force the other library to use v2 because Gradle picks the highest version. 
But the other library, like every library, is shipped as bytecode. So this isn't shipped as source code, contrary to the app. So this one will expect the version without parameters to exist, and it no longer exists. So this will then break compilation. Um, I'm not going to dive deeper into like how to fix this, but there's two great blog posts that I want to call out. I highly recommend checking those out. I will also publish my slides so then you uh, have a link to those blog posts. Um, and a way to make sure that you like maintain compatibility is by using the binary compatibility plugin. This is a plugin by Kotlin. Um, you have to configure it a bit, say like which packages you want to ignore and so on. But once it is added, it's actually fairly straightforward. You can run an API dump, which, which creates like a snapshot of your API. You check those into source control. And then on every CI build, you just run like API check. And then this tool checks between like the new API versus old API. And if it's different, it will break your build. Um, and then minimizing API surface. Like, yeah, designing an API is like naming a baby, like you're going to be stuck with a poorly chosen name forever. Um, but it's like a bit more than that, because think about it from a customer's point of view. Like, if I go to Android, I always rely heavily on like the autocomplete by Android Studio to just see what's there and what can I use. So you want to like optimize your library to like work in such a way. So like it should be easy to learn, hard to make a mistake, only one way to do a particular task, which makes it like easier for our customers, but also like easier for us to maintain because the smaller API surfaces, the less we have to maintain. Um, and like if you add if you doubt, like, should I add this or not, I would err on the side of, like, not adding it, because adding something too much, like, getting rid of it means deprecating it and then stripping it out, which is just, like, a tedious cycle. Um, and then, like, lastly, also try to avoid typos, which is, like, a very unfortunate if they persist in your API. Um, and to minimize the API surface, a pro tip I have is to like enable strict mode for Kotlin. Um, so Kotlin, unfortunately, lovely language, love it very much, but the default visibility is public. So that means you could actually be exposing more of your internals than you expect. Like running strict mode will force you to define a visibility on every single class, um, which will help. Um, all right. Then if you want to add like a new API to your SDK, but you're not really sure whether you want to like maintain it forever yet, Kotlin has a really great way of like defining experimental APIs. So you can define your own annotation. Um, you can say like this requires opt-in, and if a user doesn't, it should error. Um, and then in your library, you can annotate the methods that are like experimental with this annotation. And if somebody wants to use them, they would need to annotate their function or class or even module with this um, opt-in annotation. There's actually two different opt-in annotations, which is slightly confusing. Um, but the one with the Kotlin namespace, namespace, the one on top, this is like supported by the Kotlin compiler. So it only works on Kotlin codes. The other one, is built into like Android Lint. So it does also work with Java code, but this then only works like when somebody actually runs Lint. So like probably when they use Android Studio. Um, and then this is a really cool feature. Like, yeah, I'm sorry that the text isn't coming through, but if you add a deprecation on top of a method, like the add deprecate, you can actually specify replace with which is a hint to like Android Studio of like, hey, if you see the old initialized method, you probably want to like replace it with this, and then Android Studio can like quick fix your new API for your customers, which is really cool. Another thing you can do is you can add like a deprecation level hidden. And this is really cool because what this is gonna do is like Kotlin is gonna or Android Studio is gonna pretend like this method doesn't exist at all, you can't see it, you can't access it. But when you compile your library, it will still add this method to the binary to maintain like backwards binary compatibility. Uh, and this is the last tip, I guess. So if you want to ship ProGuard rules within your SDK, 
there is a way to do that which is called consumer ProGuard rules. So these rules will then be added to the binary and then you don't need to ask your customers to configure anything. So let's wrap things up. So Android libraries are underrated because this is what fundamentally drives innovation in our ecosystem. Um, unfortunately though, like tools are lacking. If you're building your own library, try to keep your API service as small as possible, limit modules, and also reduce your transitive dependencies. If you want to read more about these things, I actually write a blog, I have like a few relevant uh, blog posts about like library development you may want to check out. I have some image credits, quite a few amazing blog posts that I recommend checking out. And that was it. Thanks for coming to my talk. We have a few minutes for questions, so if there are any, I would be happy to answer them. Please note that there's also an office hours, like around three-ish, where you can also just come to me and I'm also happy to help out. Any questions? There's one. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, if you tried uh, relocation and if you have any tips or advice ar around that. What do you mean um, with relocation? It's like when you, you still package a dependency but you, you, you rename its, uh, its a package so you can use it without any risk of uh, having uh, conflicts. Yeah, but like for instance, Jar Jar. Yeah. Yeah. So like... Um, if we go back in the slides, where was it? So if you run into like a dependency conflict with two libraries like what we had with like Protomuff, um, yeah. So another way to solve this case is like instead of us relying on like an external dependency, we could also just say like, hey, you know what? We're gonna take this external dependency and we're gonna rename its package name ourselves. So then we like essentially create like a protobuf dash library, which then just contains our package name prefix. And that way we also avoid um, dependency conflicts with others. This is something we have considered, um, but like the artifact is fairly beefy. And like the downside of this is that this would like impact our SDK size, one. Plus also, it's like when we do that, which is by the way, it's, I think it's totally legal to do, but like if we do that, also like we are suddenly also on the hook to make sure that like security vulnerabilities for this library and so on are patched, right? Whereas otherwise, if we use them as a transitive dependency and there is a security vulnerability, like our customers can say like, hey, nay, no, force a new version. Like if we're gonna include that into our library, there's an SDK size and then also like, yeah, we also need to make sure that we immediately fix issues when they arise. So that's why we didn't go for this. Okay, thank you. That Excellent question. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. One more question, sorry. Oh. Well, my question is about obfuscation uh, of libraries where uh, some, somewhere we have to have our library code hidden, obfuscated, pro-guarded for, for that uh, users won't be uh, able to easily access what's inside our libraries, but however access parts where it, where it they should access. Um, any tips about what type of obfuscation to use, how, what, what are the things to keep, how to keep things uh, to users in a way that, um, that they, they are still accessible? This is the first question. And the second question is about, uh, about the way to debug because uh, sometimes we count on crashlytics or anything that's on the user side and all we get about the error is a.b.c. So we have to, 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 to dig deep to know what, what's the class that's giving the error. So this is the question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. That's a bit painful. Um, so 
like what we do is like everything that should be public, we have it in our own, like internally we actually, we model everything, we have like a public package and an internal package. So we split our codes in our code base is actually already split, so then we know like, hey, if we compile this, like this is the stuff that should be visible, this is the stuff that isn't. And then we've went through this rigorous process, like we, we only do it when we need to modify ProGuard, but then when we modify our ProGuard configuration, we actually build our application, then we see like, okay, what's now ending up in the actual APK and what's not, so then we include our library, like we look at our library ourselves, the AER file, and then we see like what's now actually there, what isn't. So it's like a tedious manual way to verify. Um, so that's that, like there's no super good way to, to do that. So I would just like, I would model it in your source codes to put the stuff that should be public in a separate package so you, so you already know what to expect. I would test rigorously. Um, and then what we do is, um, so we upload the, the mapping files of our ProGuard configuration to some internal tool. So if we get an issue from our customer, like at least we can like backtrack and see what, what's happening, like we can deobfuscate. And we also like, we try to not make any assumptions about like the environment of like our customers. So we don't like, whether they use Crashlytics or not, like we don't really care about it. It's just like, if they want their bug to be fixed, like the stack trace needs to end up with us at some, in some way or the other, right? So they just like have to like give us the stack trace and then we can take it from there. Yeah, it's not like, I'm happy to talk more during like office hours, but this is hard to give like general advice on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah, have a great conference.